My guest today is Tibby Vera. Tibby's worked in change management programs and transformations for over 20 years. She held senior management positions in corporate finance, investment banking, and organized change within leading organizations, including the big four consultants. Before setting up Sparkling Performance, a neuroscience-based training and consulting solutions firm, she spent a number of years researching in applied neuroscience, and after having studied the patterns of hundreds of leaders and organizations in the process of adaptation of change, she created the PEPI model. This is aimed at helping lay people understand how they react to change and to help themselves and others deal with personal change. Tibby has a distinguished background. She has an MSc in clinical neuroscience, an MBA, and a master's certificate in neuroeconomics. She is also the director of the International Academy of Neuroscience and Education in the UK, a member of the British Neuroscience Association, and a fellow of the Institute of Leadership and Management. Tibby has trained hundreds of managers and executives in the latest application of research of brain science and has over 3,000 hours of coaching experience. Welcome, Tibby. Thank you. Tibby, so how does an understanding of neuroscience sort of help managers or empower managers to better lead and motivate their teams, particularly in these days of a lot of pressure, a lot of change, huge shifts going on in the way we work? Richard, I think um, neuroscience provides a lot of insights, right? I think this is what we have learned. Uh, it provides insights about how our brain behaves, what neurochemistry it gets released during times of threat, or we can call it a stressful pressure, or during times of reward. And I think as a leader, one of our main responsibility is to try to understand those behaviors. If we as a leader understand what can put a team under pressure, what is causing threat, what is causing a stress, and how we are behaving as a result of that, we can help much better to actually succeed. Also, if we as a leader understand what makes us feel more rewarded, what makes us feel more um, included within an organization, we have much more chances to succeed. One of the biggest insights that neuroscience has provided us is that our brain is kind of binary. We are either wired for threat or for reward. That, I mean, that, that's fascinating, really, but how does neuroscience tackle the issue of authenticity? So, you know, a lot of people will say they care about their staff. A lot of people will say that, you know, they want to help people. But at the same time, they just add more and more work and they have this sympathetic view. So, you know, does the sort of the insight into neuroscience help with the authenticity piece? I would say yes, definitely. I think what neuroscience helps us um, is to understand how we can be more empathetic as well. I mean, empathy, uh, we know, is something that we can learn. Not necessarily everybody has the same level of empathy. And I think definitely knowing uh, what can help us to develop empathy can help our brain has some neurons called mirror neurons. And I think if we can learn how to activate those neurons as a leader, also help us with transparency and with trust as well. So how can a manager do this? I mean, you know, in, in sort of management literature, people often talk about tools or techniques. What are some common tools that are available for managers to enable them to learn more about neuroscience. You know, could you give me an example of, say, two or three of the most popular tools that you use, that you try and get the people that you're coaching to think about, adapt and apply in the workplace? Yes. Um, and I would say, especially the last five, year, five years, it had been, we had been bombarded with a lot of tools um, and a lot of them um, about neuroscience. To me, one of the most important is actually organizational safety. 
psychological safety, right? Learning about what the basis of psychological safety are, to me, is one of the most important tools to learn that. Um, in terms of tools, um, we have developed Pepe model, and I think Pepe model uh, is a great tool to actually start from that basis. Once we have that basis covered within the within leaders, I think we can move to the next step. That's what I would say. So the first one it will be psychological safety. And then the second one is how can we create an organization where we can actually learn from any errors, any mistakes, so it helps us growth. I think that's the only way we can actually approach uh, the challenges that we are currently having for change, for constant change, for innovation. So that's the second one. It is how we approach a failure, how we approach error. And the third one, um, I think it is as a manager, what tools do we have to manage energy of the organization? And at the same time, how do we manage a state of calmness? And to me, I think that is one of the key uh, skills that a leader needs to have, especially if we are going into a dynamic, into in dynamic organizations, challenging times, agile environments. Uh, each of those environments provide a challenge to leaders to what is the sweet spot? How much energy do you need to provide? How much good stress, in a way, you need to provide to get the benefit from the adrenaline, that what, what that is what is the advantage of stress is let's get the best of it, but please do not get the bad stress. Don't get the anxiety. Tibby, the the question around psychological safety is a very interesting one for me because I've been in meetings where the concept is it is a safe environment in which to criticize. It's a safe environment in which one can be honest. But you need everybody in that meeting to accept that position and to live by that position, not just during the meeting, but outside the meeting. So it's a great idea. It's a great theoretical concept, but how does that actually work in practice? How do you get a whole group of people in a meeting room to genuinely accept that in that meeting, people can criticize, people can say what they feel needs to be said in that meeting in a psychological safety way and not have any repercussions afterwards? It seems a very high risk thing to be the first person to to be open and to be authentic in that meeting. How do organizations deal with that to make sure everybody lives up to that standard? I would say is value other people's opinion. And I think it is about inclusion, being inclusive and trying to hear what others have to say. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think this is a snowball, right? It doesn't come from one day. I think you need to start from the top of the organizations is top leaders openly recognize a mistake that they have made if they openly take that jump or take that risk that you're talking about, um, other people can learn from it. And again, we come back to the topic of the mirror neurons. I think as a leaders, we need to be that role example um, where slowly we are open um, to recognize those errors and then that will cascade down slowly. Again, the, the recognition of errors is, is another, I think it's a very fraught area because there's this, there's a difference between people being very open about, I got this wrong, I made a mistake, what do we learn from it? To the other end of that spectrum, when people continually make mistakes or their work is incorrect and needs to be resolved by a colleague, who then push back and say, I thought we were open organization. I thought we, you know, we basically celebrated our errors. Why are you penalizing me for making errors? 
and it becomes more of a performance issue rather than a learning opportunity. Do you see a difference in that with your clients about how you you deal with that in in many ways a dichotomy? I do. Yes, and I think it's also depending on what kind of organizations and how regulated they are. Actually, it came to my mind an example. A couple of weeks ago, I was working with a pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm basically making an error there. It could be dying of, of living, right? Um, what I could say is that one thing are uh, operational mistakes, right, operational errors. And those are the ones that we should probably try to, to reduce the most, right? And the other ones uh, we are talking, which are not necessarily operational, but when we are in front of change, when we are in front of complexity, innovation, those are the errors that we don't need to encourage then, but we need to have a system that can support the learning from them. Now, even though within the same operational errors, we can create an environment that, yes, we recognize that we don't want to make mistakes. At the end, this is the total quality, what, what we want. However, we can have a system next to it that it, say, it doesn't celebrate, but we reflect from the learning. I think the person who made the mistake, not necessary, is the responsible for the mistake. And this is what we need to learn. So we need to have a system that it doesn't penalize the person who made the mistake, but it learn what is it around. And it could be just that the person is born out, right? Uh, and I think that's what we need to capture as a leader. And I think that's what neuroscience can help us in understand where the threat come from that might have triggered those mistakes. Tibby, earlier you spoke about the Pepe model. Could you just take us through the model you know, at a high level? What does Pepe stand for? And you know, why is it important for managers in the workplace to understand the model? Yeah, definitely. Pepe is a model um, that originally... Uh, it was a model or my tools that I, were, I was using as part of about 10 years research in neuroscience to help managers leading with change. And slowly, it came quite powerful um, as a tool to actually help in any type of change, right? Uh, it could be organizational change personal change, or just the people's side of the change. Basically, all what Pepe does, it provides a very simple framework that it can help anybody go step by step in different elements that cause resistance to change. And most importantly, it provides very simple strategies and tips about how to overcome them. Your question was, what does it stand for? Pepe stands for pain, energy, peaks and valleys, and errors, which basically are the four domains that we know the brain is resistant. So we basically say our brain is not wired for change. However, we are wired to adapt because plasticity, the nature of the brain, is we will always adapt. And basically, Pepe came as a result of studying those patterns of adaptations. We know that at the end of the day, most of the people will always adapt to change. Pepe comes an issue of not adapting to change. It's not a, a, a tool uh, for for the change itself is a tool to help the positive adaptation to change. If we know that we're going to adapt to change, let's make sure we adapt positive to change. And I think that change the focus and the perspective when we are managing change. Um, what Pepe helps is basically in a moment where change is not anymore about going through a curve of change from a shock to the 
acceptancy of the change. But when we have to live with change every day, it is providing those tools about how do we deal with that pain, with that feeling uncomfortable, how do we provide energy to the people who are in the change with suddenly you are dark and you have many things to do. How do I provide that energy to give the motivation? And what we were talking earlier, Richard, about the peaks, that sweet spot, about managing high level of energy, but at the same time managing the calmness. What is the sweet spot? How do you bring people into the flow to support change? And the last one, which is the error, is how do we make sure we help our brain not to, not to provide a big error signal between my expectation and my reality. And that's by what basically um, Pepe helped for. Hmm. This resistance or acceptance of change, in all of your research and your work, is this a generational thing? Yeah. Is there something that says, you know, people under the people between the ages of say twenty and thirty are more amenable to change, more adaptable to change, whereas people say between forty and fifty are not? Or is it yeah, does it affect everybody, all generations in a similar way? Is it a, is there a a human resistance to change that is just timeless, or does it change? I mean often people's views on the world change as they get older, but you know, does people's resistance to change also change as they get older? Um, I would say there are stages where the brain is more plastic and more uh, adaptable. However, we know now that at any age, we are able to adapt, to change. In terms of the resistance, what I would say more than age it is about what had been our memory to change. Therefore, if you are three, four years old, you have less memory or less negative memory, less bad adaptation. Now, you could be four years old and have lived a traumatic experience, which will make you really resistant to change. So rather than be from the brain age perspective, it's about the memory that our brain accumulates. And obviously, if we are 60, 70 years old, well, we have longer memory, don't we? Oh, that's fascinating. I mean, that's a really interesting insight. It's something I hadn't thought of in the past that, you know, as you go through life, so you build up a a collection of experiences, and if you've had a lot of negative experiences about something, then you have that negative view about it, and vice versa if you had a lot of positive experiences. But talking about sort of going through life, yeah, I can remember when I started my career, there were some sort of leadership models, and most of the leadership models back then was sort of built around sort of military type leadership, command and control type leadership frameworks. How has the understanding of neuroscience and in particular the work that you're doing, your colleagues are doing, bringing neuroscience into management, how is that influencing some of the leadership frameworks, the leadership advice that we're now seeing from you know, various authors around the world? Oh, enormously, I would say, Richard. I think that military type of uh, leadership style, the more traditional one, was very much based on the threat system, right? We were talking earlier about the binary part of the brain between threat and reward. And we know that we perform much sustainable and we acquire less negative memory if we act more into the reward, if we move more towards reward. And therefore, I think this has shaped to go all the way to one of the latest probably leadership frameworks, which are a compassionate leadership. I think we have probably moved all the way there, right? And, and then it is a matter, I'm not saying one is more right than the other one and we should go all the way there. I think each leadership is la a style will help to serve different purposes. What I think neuroscience help is to make sure 
we adopt the right leadership framework that provide the right chemistry that you need to lead into that environment. I always say that it's easier to work with the neurobiology in our side rather than against us. And I give you an example. If you are um, leading an organization that needs innovation and creativity, we need to move people into really rewarded state. We need to take them out of extreme stress. We need to move them out of threat. And we need to promote insights. We need to promote that individuals go to goes and have mind-wandering moment because we know creativity comes from insights. We know from studying the brain that insights come when we are not purposely thinking about the problem. So here, when we are building leadership frameworks, is are we actually aligning both? Are we aligning the biology of our team to what do we want to achieve? And I think that is what comes really important for leaders, not to know a master in neuroscience, but to know the basics, what chemistry help and how we can tweak it or, or hack that biology. Tibby, thank you very much. Tibby, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could have gone on for a lot, lot longer. Many thanks for finding the time to have this conversation with me. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for inviting me.